ever wondered how massive platforms like Twitter, Facebook, YouTube and Instagram, each with billions of registered users, quickly check if a username or email ID is already in use during sign up? By the way, this is a common interview question too. Imagine comparing a new username against billions of existing users. It would take forever. So what strategies do these tech giants use? In today's video, we are diving into how this is done in real world applications with billions of registered users. Hi there, welcome to Tech and Career Bytes. I'm a software professional with over two decades of experience, including seven years in leadership roles at a global product based organization. As digital platforms scale to billions of users, efficiently managing user account creation becomes a challenge. Specifically, we need to quickly and accurately check if a username or email ID is already taken without querying massive data sets that are costly and time consuming to search. A simple database query could become a bottleneck, leading to performance issues and poor user experience. In this video, we will explore several strategies to tackle this challenge, along with the pros and cons of each. So, Without further ado, let's get started. First up, the most straightforward solution. Querying the database directly to check if a user exists. This approach works well for smaller databases, but becomes inefficient as the number of users grows. The database query can be slow, especially if the database is distributed across multiple servers or if the index is large. This approach is like asking a librarian for a specific book. They check the records and let you know if it is available. But if your library has billions of books, that search can take a while. Here is how you might implement this direct database query approach in Java. This simple query checks if an email exists in our user table. It works fine, but as your system scales, it starts to get a bit heavy. Okay, so direct queries might not be the best option at scale. What's next? Let's bring in some speed with caching. Caching can mitigate the performance issues of direct database queries by storing frequently accessed data in a fast temporary storage layer. This reduces the need to hit the database repeatedly. Here is how caching works. When a user tries to create an account, the system first checks the cache to see if the username or email already exists. If the data is not found in the cache, that is a cache miss, the system queries the database. The result is then stored in the cache for future requests. Cached data typically has an expiration time to ensure stale information is eventually refreshed. We have a separate video diving deep into caching in distributed systems. If you are curious, you can watch that by clicking the link in the description box. Caching is like keeping a copy of frequently asked questions right on your desk. If someone asks for something you have already looked up, you don't have to go back to the library. Much faster. Right? To implement this caching approach in Java, you could use something like a concurrent hash map to store these frequently asked questions, like whether a user's email already exists. If it is in the cache, great. If not, we hit the database, get the answer, and cache it for next time. In production, a more robust caching solution like Redis might be used. By caching these checks, you are reducing the load on your database and speeding up response times. Caching also helps a system's scale by efficiently handling repeated requests for the same data. But caching alone is not perfect. What if your cache misses? Or worse, what if it serves stale data? Plus, Caches consume memory and if not managed properly, they can lead to excessive memory usage. 
For instance, if each username requires around 10 bytes of memory, storing a billion usernames would need 10 gigabytes of memory. That is where the balance comes in. But more on that in a bit. Stay tuned. Now, let's talk about something really exciting. Bloom filters. Bloom filters offer a highly efficient probabilistic way to test whether a username or email already exists. They are particularly useful for systems handling billions of users where both space and speed are critical. Here is how Bloom filters work to check if a user exists. A bit array of size m is created and initialized to 0. Then k independent hash functions that map an input like an email address to k positions in the bit array are selected. When a user registers, their email is hashed with the k functions and the corresponding positions in the bit array are flipped to 1. When a new user tries to register, their email is hashed with the same k functions. If all corresponding positions in the bit array are 1, the email might be in use. Though a false positive is possible. If even one bit is zero, the email is definitely not in use. The values of M and K are critical for the performance and accuracy of a Bloom filter. Let's understand how these values are determined. The values of M and K are determined based on the expected number of elements N and the desired false positive probability P. M is calculated to balance memory usage with the acceptable false positive rate. And K is chosen to minimize false positives while maintaining efficient performance. Here are the formulas used. For a platform as large as Twitter, maintaining a low false positive rate, typically less than 1% is crucial. This prevents users from being informed incorrectly that a username or email ID is already in use when it is not. Here is how the key parameters used in the formula are set for a platform like Twitter. Twitter aims for a false positive rate of less than 1% to ensure accuracy. So P value is 1%. To manage billions of users with such a low false positive rate, the bit array size needs to be substantial, often several gigabytes. Using the formula, the hypothetical M value would be about 9.6 billion bits or approximately 1.2 gigabytes. For Twitter, with around 1 billion users, the optimal number of hash functions would be around 10, according to the formula. In practice, massive platforms like Twitter combine Bloom filters with other data structures and caching methods to efficiently manage user accounts. Bloom filters are super efficient, especially when you are dealing with billions of entries. Here is a quick implementation in Java using the Guava library. Bloom filters do come with a small trade-off. They can sometimes indicate that an email is in use when it is really not, known as a false positive. However, Bloom filters will never incorrectly indicate that an email is not in use when it actually exists. Given their speed and space efficiency, they are often worth it, especially when combined with other strategies. Another drawback is that traditional Bloom filters do not support deletion. Once a user account is added to a traditional Bloom filter, it cannot be removed. This means that even if the user deletes their account, the Bloom filter may still indicate that the username or email might exist, leading to potential inaccuracies or false positives. This limitation can be addressed with variations like counting Bloom filters. Here is how it works in the context of deleting a user account. When a user account is created, the Bloom filters counters at the hashed positions are incremented. When a user account is deleted, 
the counters at the hashed positions are decremented. If the counter at a position reaches zero, it reflects that no active accounts are using that position, indicating that the user account does not exist. Each method has its strengths. Direct database queries are precise, but can be slow. Caching is fast, but requires careful management. And Bloom filters are lightning quick with minimal memory footprint, though they might not always be 100% accurate. For a robust, scalable solution, you can combine these three approaches. Here is how it works. First, use a Bloom filter to quickly eliminate usernames or emails that are definitely not in use. Second, for entries that pass the Bloom filter, check the cache to see if the data is available there. And finally, if the data is not in the cache, query the database as the final step. Update the cache with the result to optimize future queries. Here is an example of combining all three strategies in Java. So how do the other big players do it? Let's take a look. Google uses Bloom filters in Bigtable to minimize disk reads. Facebook leverages them for friend recommendations and messages, ensuring fast and efficient processing. And HBase, another giant in distributed storage, uses Bloom filters to speed up data retrieval. If it is good enough for them, it is probably good enough for us, right? So there you have it, a complete toolkit for checking if a user exists, even among billions. Start with the basics, scale up with caching, and when you are ready for the big leaks, bring in Bloom filters. And remember, the best solutions often combine multiple approaches to balance speed, accuracy, and resource usage. If you found this video helpful, give us a thumbs up. And subscribe to our channel for more interesting tech topics. Do check out our other videos on software performance optimization case studies, coding, system design, big data, and career growth. My name is Rupa, and I thank you so much for watching this video. See you next time 